really excited because today we are closing out the series that we have been in for the last few weeks, and that's this series called Take the Land. Uh, together over the last several weeks, we've been looking at the first six chapters in Joshua, and so we get to wrap up that study together today. Uh, you know, Joshua is a book that's very central to our DNA here at Captivate, and that's because it does a really great job of giving us an example of what it means to do this thing we call living wholeheartedly. How do you live wholeheartedly? How do you live with passion, with intentionality? How do you live a life of purpose? What we learn in the book of Joshua is that this doesn't actually happen without obedience. We cannot please the Lord. We cannot live a full life the way that he has called us to if we're not actively on offense, right? I think often as Christians, we focus on being defensive. We focus on the things that maybe we shouldn't do, on the things that we need to avoid. And, and I would say that there's probably a lot of life that we miss out on. There is ways that God wants to move that we don't experience when we don't get on offense, you know, and I get it. As Christians, there are things that we need to avoid, sin that we need to stay away from, but there's a passive way to do that, and there's also an active way to do that, right? We can walk through life cautiously and timidly and nervously, right, afraid to get our nice, bright, new Christianity dirty, or we can run into our calling, we can run into the spiritual emergency rooms all around us and let our passion and our zeal for the Lord be the thing that drives us into holiness and away from sin, Right? we got to get on offense. There's a famous sports phrase that says that the best defense is a good offense. And that's true of sports, but it's also true of life. And it's especially true of our faith. I'll give you an example. In 1964, Ken Johnson became the only pitcher in MLB history to throw a 980 no-hitter and yet still lose the game. And why do you think he lost the game? Well, because his team had no offense. They played almost the best defense that you can play in baseball. They made one slip, one error, and the team lost one to zero because they could not score any runs. Or what about my marriage, right? I can live in purity. I can not lust, not cheat on my wife. But if I stop there, my wife would say, well, that's great, but what else? Right? Can you imagine that? Babe, I didn't plan anything for anniversary this year, but I also didn't commit adultery. Uh, she'd look at me like, well, thanks, I guess. I mean, that's kind of weird, right? There's so much more to life. There's so much more to our faith than simply playing defense. And the reality is that we can't end spiritual loneliness, right, if we're just playing defense. We can't be in our own little corner of the world hoping that darkness doesn't get on us, right? No, we got to be guns blazing on the offensive. See, the Bible tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail. And I don't know about you, but I've never actually seen a gate move, right? Gates are an object of defense, the Bible is saying hell will not be able to defend against our offense. Because when you get on the offensive, you put darkness on the back foot. And now it's no longer us trying to keep up with the darkness around us, but rather it is the darkness around us trying to keep up with us, right? Trying to keep up with the on-fire church that God has called us to be, right? If we're going to do that, if we're going to push back darkness, then we need to be on offense because there's too many hurting and broken people. There's too much loneliness. There's too many broken families, too much anxiety, too much depression, too many hopeless people out there for us to just live out of a passive Christianity. You know, Christianity is not just about what you avoid. It's about what you do. We've said that throughout the series that you can do nothing wrong and yet still do nothing right. And so if we're going to make an impact in our world, we have to get on offense. And so that's what this book is all about, getting on the offensive. And what we're going to see today is that that doesn't actually happen without faith. So turn in your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter 6. We'll have it here on the screen for you as well. Today we're going to look at one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament, and that is the Battle of Jericho. If you know anything about this story, you know that it's actually not much of a battle, is it? Uh, VeggieTales calls it a battle, so I think that's what we're going to go with. But it's actually just the culmination of the people of Israel finally entering into the promised land. And, and this has been a long time coming. About 40 years earlier in the story, God was ready to open up the doors of the promised land to the Israelites, except they were afraid. They doubted God's plans for them. They complained. And so God said, forget it. They disregarded God's voice, they disregarded his sovereignty, and as a result, they were sent into wandering in the desert. For 40 years, actually, they wandered in the desert until every last person who had doubted God's voice and God's direction had died. And this is where the book of Joshua picks up, with God telling Joshua, all right, it's time, I'm ready to send you back in. 
And so over the last few chapters, we've seen God prepare them and call them for this moment. We've seen him perform miracles, like literally stopping the waters of the Jordan River so they could cross it on dry land. And now comes this moment of truth. They are face to face with the promised land. The only thing that's standing in the way is this giant fortified city called Jericho. Here's what the Bible says in verse 2. The Lord said to Joshua, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. Well, that was quick. Battle hasn't even started, right? And already God said that it's over. However, there is one thing that they got to do first. Here's the direction that God gives them. Verse 3, march around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. It's interesting. I mean, it's not exactly what we would have thought. There's no mention of catapults or bulldozers or wrecking balls. But, but here's what's even more fascinating, all right? Verse 7, so Joshua ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. God gave a direction and Joshua obeyed. Joshua obeyed. And we're going to talk about that more in just a little bit, but here's what happens going down to verse 15. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Later in verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed so that everyone charged straight in and they took the city. See, Joshua 6 is this wonderful story of redemption. See, for all of the sins of the people of Israel, which were many, perhaps their greatest was their unbelief. They had seen incredible signs and wonders. They saw the 10 plagues befall Egypt. They saw God part the waters of the Red Sea. They saw him miraculously provide manna for heaven from them to eat. And yet at every turn, they met God's direction with unbelief and with doubt. And they paid the price for that. God shut the doors of the promised land. Listen, unbelief is sin, and God takes it extremely seriously. And what that illustrates is that when you have seen God move, you lose the right to believe that he can't. They had seen God move. And so they no longer had the ability to believe that God was not able to miraculously provide. And when, he, when they did, they were left to deal with the consequences. Joshua had seen God move. He was there. He, he was one of the few that actually made it through those 40 years in the desert because of his belief. He and his friend Caleb were the only ones that were willing to go into the promised land. And although they wandered with the rest of the Israelites, now that God is opening up the doors of the promised land, it's Joshua at the center of the story all over again. For 40 years, he waited for this moment when he would get his opportunity to right the wrongs of the past. And he does. He obeys. And finally, the people of Israel experience breakthrough. But the truth is that none of this happens without faith. And that is central to what we're going to talk about today because I think that we don't often grasp what true faith really is. And what we know is that if we can't grasp it, then we'll never really be able to use it. Right? Faith isn't just words or thoughts or feelings or emotions or beliefs. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the substance. Can someone say substance? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is evidence. It's real. It's not just an idea. It's actually substance. It's direction. It's action. It's redemption. It's connection. It's evidence. But evidence requires exercise. All right? You're going to want to write that down. Evidence requires exercise. If we are going to see proof of our faith, then we have got to practice it. All right, the older generation of Israel missed out on God's move because they were unable to exercise their faith. And that should be a warning to us today. We will miss out on God's breakthrough if we do not exercise our faith. We will miss out on God's breakthrough if we cannot exercise our faith. Our faith has to be more than words or thoughts or ideas or emotions. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. If faith is evidence, then what does that evidence look like? What does it mean for us and how do we walk in that? How do we as believers actually exercise our faith? 
One thing we know is that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so what does real faith actually look like? Let's take a look at that together. We're going to unpack what faith is. In fact, if you want to title your notes today, you can call this message exactly that, Faith Is. We're going to learn what faith is, and to do that, I've got four points for you this morning. Point number one is that faith is direction. All right? Faith is direction. One of the signs that our faith is real or that it has substance is that it has a process. Right? Here's one thing that you got to know is that God's promises always come with a process. God's promises will always come with a process. And why is that? Well, it's because the process produces character. Romans chapter 5 tells us that we ought to rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. The process not only reveals the character within us, but if we press into it, it actually creates godly character inside of us. God's promises always come with a process, but the truth is that we often want God's processes without his process, don't we? Right? And why do you think that is? Listen, this is a safe space, so I think that it's safe to admit that sometimes God's ways don't seem to make sense, right? Like, they're mysterious. Let's be honest. Sometimes God's ways are kind of weird. The ways of the kingdom are strange, aren't they? If you want success, it takes humility. Prosperity takes generosity. Healthy and thriving intimacy means purity. Trials mean worship. The kingdom process is so backwards to our regular thinking it's so opposed to our earthly processes that often we can't wrap our minds around it. Like the answer to Jericho was worship? Like that doesn't make sense, right? Imagine Joshua comes back and he says, hey, I've got an idea. We're going to walk around the city and we're going to sing. I've been looking at him like he's crazy. Like what are you talking about? And yet that was God's process. Listen, we cannot be a people that miss out on God's promises because we fail to live out his process. We have to trust that even in the trial, even in the things that God calls us to that are so opposed to everything that we see out there, that God is still working, that he still has a plan, that he knows what he's doing. And yeah, that means even in the waiting. You know, waiting is often a big part of God's process. Even as they circle the city, they circle the walls of Jericho, it doesn't fall after the first day or after the first time around. They had to wait. God's promises often take time. Success and financial stability takes time. Healthy intimacy takes time. Breakthrough often takes time. And let's be honest, that's hard. Waiting is hard. Some of you guys have been waiting for a long time for healing, for breakthrough in a relationship, for an answered prayer, for a miracle maybe. And meanwhile, God simply tells us, he says, trust me, can you trust that I know the way? Which I think begs the question, could it be that part of the prize is actually found in the process? Could it be that waiting is actually a gift? You know, my family and I are big soccer fans, big Argentina soccer fans specifically. Uh, You can imagine how excited we were when Argentina won the World Cup last year. My favorite player is Messi, who you may have heard of. A lot of people think that he's the best player ever. Fell in love watching soccer uh, because of him and the way that he plays and dribbles and shoots and everything else. And I was reading an article about him recently in TED Ideas, which are the same people that do TED Talks and TED Conferences. And it talked about how athletes deal with anxiety. See, for all of his like otherworldly talent, he's also really famously anxious. For years, you would see him like right before a game throwing up like right on the field before the game. I'm talking minutes, sometimes seconds before the game was about to start. And and, and so how did he go from that moment of anxiety to then putting on these incredible displays of skill? Well, after a lot of like research and studying, people found that the answer was often in the waiting, right? The game kicks off and you can often see him just kind of walking around and he's looking around and he's watching and he's waiting for the game to come to him, but he's not rushing, he's not you know, doing everything that he can to get into it. He's kind of just waiting for a far, waiting for that moment. In fact, there was a game in 2017 where his team Barcelona played their arch rivals Real Madrid. And out of a 90-minute soccer game, Messi ran for a total of four minutes. Four minutes was all that he ran. And yet in those four minutes, he scored a goal, he assisted another, he created multiple chances for the team, and they got the win. And so the lesson for us is pretty obvious, right? In moments of anxiety... We pause and we slow down. 
right? Waiting is a gift. Now, this isn't just an observation about sports. Scientists have found that this is actually one of the most effective responses to anxiety. There's clinical research that supports this idea of pausing and waiting in response to stress. Right? In fact, Dr. Judson Brewer, who's a neuroscientist and psychiatrist, he found that mastering the art of intentionally pausing and waiting is one of the most effective tools towards managing stress, breaking addictions, and dealing with anxiety. See, when we're stressed, our nature tells us we got to go, 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 go. And yet there's a purpose in the waiting. Right? You see that? Again, God is saying, trust me. Trust that I know the way. Trust my directions. And trust me enough to act. And that's point number two. The second thing that we got to know about our faith is that faith is action. Faith is action. Faith is obedience, right? That's pretty straightforward. The proof that I believe is found in my actions. That which you will believe will by definition have corresponding actions. Real beliefs always have corresponding actions. You know, when I was little, I I believed that I was the crocodile hunter. And so I would run around the backyard trying to find lizards and snakes and yelling, crikey! You know, my son for a long time believed he was a T-Rex, and so he would roar and he would bite you and he wouldn't eat his vegetables because he's a carnivore, obviously. And and, and those are kind of goofy examples, right? But what about this? Recently, uh, I uncovered a moment in my childhood where I believed truly that I was not good enough. Uh, And I realized that I have lived the last 21 years in response to that moment, trying to prove to people around me, no, I promise I am good enough. Please, somebody tell me that I'm good enough. That's what happens when you meet with Pastor Rick, by the way. The childhood wounds come out. It's good, I promise. (laughs) But listen, I believed it. And that belief dictated my actions for years. And this principle is so true for many areas in our lives, right? How many things in our lives are the result of what we believe? We give our life to career and to striving and to toil to try to accumulate as much as we can because we believe that that's the only way that I can make it in America, right? We chase status and influence and the approval of others because we believe that that's where we'll find fulfillment. We give up our bodies and our purity because we believe that that's the answer to love. And that's how the enemy works, by the way. He has no power over us. And so what does he do? He lies. Because he knows that if he tells me, hey, you're going to chase success your whole life, but you're not going to find it. You're always going to want more. You're going to be disconnected from your wife, disconnected from your kids, disconnected from your church. I mean, that doesn't sound so good. But if he can convince me that that's the only way that I can make it, well, now he's got my attention. Right? The lie is empowered the moment that we partner with it through belief. That's how Satan works. And so we've really got to self-examine those things that we believe, do they actually hold up to the truth? See, our actions are dictated by our beliefs, and yet the unfortunate reality is that one of the places where we see that happen the least is actually in our spiritual lives. We don't always act in a way that's representative of our beliefs, do we? And here's the thing, if we say that we believe God's word, but we don't live like it, then do we really actually believe Right? If we're really going to believe, God's word has to renew us. It's got to transform us. It's his truth that sets us free and changes our thinking. It births real belief within us. And belief is important. Right? Belief is our source. Belief is the source of our actions, not the other way around. Actions can't bring faith. Faith has to come first. Actions without faith have zero eternal significance. They're meaningless. Isaiah 64, 4 says that, The righteous deeds of an unrighteous man are like filthy rags. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that faith without action or with actions without faith are dead. But the inverse is also true. Faith or belief without action is also dead. James 2.14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? It's an interesting question. Here's what John MacArthur, who's one of the leading biblical scholars of our time, he says about this verse. He says, James is not disputing the importance of faith. Rather, he's opposing the notion that saving faith can be a mere intellectual exercise void of a commitment to active obedience. I'll say that again. Faith cannot just be an intellectual exercise. Listen, we can be educated past our point of obedience where we know more than we actually act on. 
Some people in church can give you four different Greek words for love, and yet they can't give it away. Or some people can recite the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and you'll never actually see them. What good is knowledge without the action to actually back it up, right? We talked about Rahab. She didn't go to seminary or the demoniac in Mark chapter 5. You probably didn't make it to Sunday school. And yet they made an impact for the kingdom of God because they took what they knew and they gave it away. They experienced God and they acted on it. They didn't keep asking God for more and more and more. No, they gave it away. Whatever they had received from the Lord, they gave away immediately. And yet sometimes we sit in church and we're like, God, give me more. Give me a fresh word. Give me a fresh vision, a new revelation. Give me something new. Here's a thought. How about we don't ask God for more until we've given away what he's given us? Right? Otherwise, we just become spiritually bloated. We're just full of knowledge with nowhere for it to go. Sean said it to me like this. He said, God won't give you what's next until you're faithful with what's now. Right? We got to be faithful. Later in verse 18, James says, some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith is action. It's something that we live out each and every day. Faith is obedience. The doors of the promised land were closed on the old generation of Israel, and it was their fault. The trial was their doing. You know, trials in our lives can happen for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's just life, and some of you guys need to know that, that sometimes the trials that we experience are simply the result of us living in a fallen and broken world. Since the fall of man, our world has drifted farther and farther away from God's plan. And so sometimes the trials that we face are simply the result of that. Sometimes the trials that we face are due to our obedience. We step out in faith into the things that God is calling us to. And the enemy doesn't like that. And so we experience a spiritual attack, right? Sometimes the trials in our lives are because of obedience. But oftentimes the trials that we experience are because of our disobedience. It's our own fault. Right? Sometimes the trial would stop if we could just obey, if we could just do what's right. The trials experienced by the Israelites were largely their fault. And so it's no surprise that leading up to this moment, these last five chapters have all been an exercise in obedience. Chapter one, God commands them, be strong and courageous. Chapter three, they can't go near the Ark of the Covenant. Chapter four, they got to take the 12 stones out of the river. Chapter five, they got to be circumcised. Chapter six, march around Jericho. So after all of the, that the people of Israel had gone through, was this going to be the moment that they could finally obey? That they could finally just get it right because it's not enough to say it. It's not enough to feel it. Faith is not emotion, it's action. I mean, how often do we sit in church and we say, I'm finally going to forgive that person or I'm finally going to serve or I'm going to quit the pornography habit or I'm going to give and we don't see breakthrough because we don't actually act on it. Right? How many emotional commitments have we made? But commitment and faith and belief is not emotion. It's action. And listen, I'm not saying that we find the strength to do these things on our own because we don't, but often we don't even take step one. We don't ask for accountability with our purity. We don't look to mend broken relationships. We don't take step one. And meanwhile, God is saying, I'm ready to move, but I'm waiting on you. I mean, what if Noah gave up building the ark, right? Or, or Joshua doesn't make it all seven laps, or, or what if Jesus doesn't follow through with the cross? And yet we get to live a part of the greatest story ever told, all because they said yes, because they acted. You know, we got to know that often on the other side of obedience is breakthrough. Often on the other side of action is redemption. And that's point number three, is that faith is redemption. Faith is redemption. Joshua 6.20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Finally, the redemption. Finally, the breakthrough. You know, in 2018, I had said yes to my first job in ministry, working part-time with Wes and Monica and Alex, who was here a couple of weeks ago, helping run the young adults ministry of the church we were at. And it really felt like, to me, the culmination of my life up to that point. 
You know, I've been a believer my entire life. I've shared before that I don't even remember being saved. Like, I don't remember a single day apart from the Lord. It's a part of my testimony that I'm really grateful for. Um, and so this job was everything to me. And two months after the role, I got promoted to full-time, and, and I was excited because I had made it. I mean, me getting to do full-time ministry, it was a dream come true. And four months after that, we, we felt God calling us to plant our own church, and so we did. We decided to go to leave behind our jobs and to begin the process of planting Captivate. And I'm not going to lie to you, for me, that decision wasn't super difficult. I mean, there was so much eagerness to see what God was going to do um, that it wasn't that hard to have faith in the beginning, you know, when things were fresh. Two weeks to the day after we made that decision, I was in the sanctuary of our church and I was praying for our team. I was praying for Wes and Monica and Alex, Emma, who was our worship leader at the time. I was praying for my wife, um, Ella. And then I felt the Lord in the middle of that just interrupt my prayers um, and say to me in a way that I've never experienced before or since. It was like I could almost audibly hear him speaking to me. He said, don't forget to pray for your son. And, and I ran home and I told Ella and the next day, sure enough, pregnancy test confirmed it. Abram was on the way. And it was my lap one, you know. It's easy to have faith on lap one. Um, there's uneasiness, for sure, but there's so much excitement. I mean, can you believe it? We're going to have a baby. This is crazy. And we're planting a church. And I remember sharing that story with a leader of mine a few weeks after that. And, and I'm like, man, isn't this wild? Like, we're going to plant this church. Now we're going to be parents. This is insane. And I remember he looked back at me and he said, man, you're lucky it's your first. Because if you had two, you wouldn't do it. That's lap four. Right now the questions are coming. Now we realize what we got ourselves into. We're looking up at the walls and we're like, man, these are really going to come down just by walking around in circles? Like, I don't know, man. I don't know, I don't know what we're doing, but I guess we got to do it. And, and so we pressed on. We left our jobs. I went back to work at the bank. I was doing freelance graphic design. Uh, meanwhile, trying to help to build the back end of the church um, in any time that was left. also picked up a job at Target. I was stocking shelves overnight. And, and I'll be honest, I was kind of proud. Like, we were doing whatever it took, right? It, it, this was the dream, right? Whatever it takes. We were struggling for the Lord. Uh, until one morning, it was towards the end of my shift as the store was opening, and, and I saw someone from our church, from our pre-launch team. They didn't see me, but I saw them. And and I don't know what came over me, but I remember in that moment, I just ran and I hid because I was so ashamed. Here I was, this like brave church planner, and I was going to help change San Diego for Jesus, and, and I was stocking shelves at Target. I told everybody what we were doing, the way that we felt that God was leading and our prayers and how we wanted God to move, and I was stocking shelves at Target. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, in that moment, I felt exposed. I felt ashamed, right? It was like in that moment, all of the questions, all of the, you're going to do what? All of the weird faces were all validated, right? It was lap six. Come on, faith is hard to come by on lap six. The Israelites have been at this for six days, and now six more laps, and there's no sign of anything, it's like, God, can we just have one brick to fall? Can we get like, like a two on the Richter scale just so they know that this thing is still happening? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the Bible doesn't say this, but I imagine the people of Jericho looking out the window like, bro, these dudes are crazy. They've been out there for seven days. Nothing is happening. What a bunch of idiots. And that's so hard to deal with. It's embarrassing. What, what are we still doing out here? But here's the thing that you got to know, all right? And, and if you're going to take anything from today... Please hear me when I say that there are some lessons that God is determined for us to learn. There are certain things that God is determined for us to learn, and one of those is to learn to say yes before the yield, to be people that can say yes before the harvest, before the reward, and before the breakthrough. God is determined that we learn that. He wants us to have faith before we see it, before that it works out, before the answer, because we cannot be a people that are controlled by what we see. That's not real faith. My faith cannot be a slave to the outcome. For six laps, they had, had, they had said yes, and they had to keep going. They had to keep going without a single sign of breakthrough. And all of those times around the wall, they confirmed one thing that the only way that this is going to happen is if God does it himself. 
I am literally helpless to do this on my own. That's what the waiting does. That's what obedience does, right? I don't know how, but I have no choice but to believe that, God, you will do this, right? We have to have the faith to wait on the promise. We have to be willing to till the soil and water the ground even when we have yet to see anything. Noah waited 75 years for the flood to come. Abraham waited decades for the promise of his son. David was persecuted. He spent years fleeing Saul while he was waiting on the promise that he would be the king. Jesus was dead for three days. Can you imagine what that's like for the disciples? Three days dead is pretty darn dead. Right? Jesus wait, or Joshua waited 40 years. Now for seven days they've been walking laps around the city. He waited in faith until what happened? Breakthrough. And redemption. Lap seven. This church, this family, you know, getting to be here with you guys this morning is my lap seven. It's breakthrough. But the reality is we don't always see the breakthrough, do we? You know, we got to know that we might not ever see the fulfillment of God's promise. I might not see my redemption. We might not see our Jericho. And and this is the truth that you're not going to hear in every church. All right, are you ready? Following Jesus doesn't mean that you get everything you want. It just doesn't. For every prayer that God has answered in my life, there are so many that I am still praying, even today. We're just not going to get everything that we want or everything that we think that we need. You know, the Bible promises that that as a believer, things are working for our good, but it doesn't promise that everything is good. It just says that things are working. And so we're called to persevere in faith to keep saying yes. You keep saying yes to God, and one of two things is guaranteed to happen. He'll either give you what you want, or he'll free you from needing it. And sometimes that's the real breakthrough. See, faith is redemption, not because I'm going to get the breakthrough I think I need, but because Jesus had the only breakthrough that really matters. When he broke through death and sin and the grave, I have my heavenly reward. I have my heavenly redemption And that means that I got to have faith even when I don't see my earthly one. In Hebrews 11, Paul writes of the faith of Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. He says in verse 13, all of these people were still living by faith. They were still saying yes to God when they died. Later in verse 32, he says, and what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. But there were others who were tortured refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. And yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something even better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Church family, our reward, your reward is coming. And so for now, we persevere in faith. And how do we do that? Point number four, faith is connection. Faith is connection. It's relationship. It's intimacy. Faith is trust. Relationship is trust. And so the question for us today is, do we trust God? Do we trust him when he tells us that he has plans to give us a hope and a future or that he'll redirect our paths like he says in Proverbs 3, 5? Do we trust him when he says in the Psalms that if we delight in him, he will give us the desires of our heart? Or in John, when he says that he has given us the right to become his children, do we trust him when he says that we are a new creation like he does in 2 Corinthians 5 or in Matthew 6, when he says that he takes care of our needs the way that he cares for the flowers of the field? Do we believe his word when he says in Revelation 21, 4, that there is a day coming when God's dwelling place will be among us and he will dwell with us. We will be his people. 
And God himself will be with us and he'll be our God. He'll wipe every tear from our eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things will have passed away. You believe that? Can we put our hope in something higher? Trust is the beginning of breakthrough. Listen, the seeds of the fall of Jericho were planted in the soil of Joshua's relationship with God. Joshua 1.5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Moses is famous for having experienced more of the God than perhaps any person ever. He saw the burning bush. He spent 40 days and 40 nights with God on Mount Sinai. The Bible says that he and God would speak like friends. They were in harmony. And God worked miracles, which tells us what? That your relationship with God is going to see the walls fall. Not your work, not the striving, not the crushing it at your job, but your relationship with God. God tells Joshua, like I was with him, I will be with you. And that's an invitation for you this morning. Jesus' last words on earth, surely I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And so maybe you feel like you've been paying the price for a dormant faith. Maybe you recognize that you've heard God's voice but failed to ask. Today is the day that that can change. Today can be a day of redemption. And so I'd love to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I would love to pray for you. Lord, firstly, I just want to pray for anybody who's out there today that would say, God, I have heard your voice. And to be honest, I've walked in the other direction. I haven't let my faith become action, whether that's out of fear or whether that's just letting other things get in the way, Lord, and I want to change that today. And so if if you're in here today and you just want a fresh dose of faith a fresh dose of boldness, a fresh dose of courage, I would just invite you to raise your hand. I would love to pray for you. God, I pray for anybody who's got their hands raised right now that would say, God, I want the boldness, I want the courage to walk into what you're calling me. I want to be a person that is known by my faith, that people would see my actions and see you, that my actions would testify of who you are, that my obedience would testify of who you are. And I also want to pray for anybody in here today that maybe is hearing this message of Jesus, this message of hope for the very first time. Maybe you hear of this Savior who loves you, who has a hope for you, who has plans for you, and you say, I want to be a part of that. I would love to pray for you as well. If there's anybody like that in this room today, would you just raise your hand? If you want to say, Lord, I want to be yours today. I want to make a commitment to be yours. I, there's nothing m- magical in this prayer. It's simply admitting, God, I have failed. There's nothing within me that can close the gap between us. But I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe that he paid the price for my sin. and Now I can confidently walk in freedom. And Lord, I commit to walk with you each and every day. And so, Lord, I want to thank you for anybody that would make that decision today. The best decision that we'll ever make on this side of eternity. Thank you for the access that you give us to you. Thank you for your heart for us as your children. And again, Lord, I pray that you would just give us the boldness and the courage to be a church that is known by our actions, that is known by our faith, that is known by our zeal and our passion for you. We love you and we honor you. In the name of your wonderful son, Jesus, amen.